Chang in San Francisco and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, the UK becomes the first to approve a COVID vaccine. How did they beat the US and is it a risk? We're going to have all the details on when you and your kids can expect a shot. Plus, amidst a big tie up between Salesforce and Slack, the bigger work from home darling Zoom reports revenue up 367%. Why then did the stock plunge 15? Zoom CFO will be my guest. And Amazon partners with an old tech stalwart whose name you might not have heard for a while, and that is BlackBerry, how they plan to revolutionize tech in your car as the next frontier. Those stories in a moment, but first, U.S. stocks posting another record high today amid news of new stimulus talks and that they are progressing with a plan to pass by the weekend. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle has more on that. Also, Abigail, I know you've been following the latest earnings results out of Snowflake, shares down after hours a bit. This is a pretty big test for them after their blockbuster debut. Yeah, it certainly is. Lots of big movers relative to earnings in the after hours, Snowflake being one of them. And of course, for Snowflake, I think what you're referencing here is that huge IPO, the biggest IPO of the year back in September. This is their first quarter uh, as a publicly traded company. So they're finding out what that's all about. But let's start out with Splunk, because these shares are absolutely plunging in the after hours, down 19% right now. This is, of course, an application uh, software company up just 37% year to date. They have struggled a little bit. And in this quarter, they posted a wider loss than expected. Revenue fell 11% on a year over year basis, also missing estimates. And the guide for revenue, most importantly, uh, missed the range. They, ran, they gave a range of 650 to $700 million, missing the estimate of up uh, to 778 million dollars so a pretty big miss there and so this really points to the idea that this is a nice to have technology company and quite frankly they're not executing now snowflake is off of its uh after hour lows right now down almost four percent they put up a less than perfect quarter this stock up more than 140 percent since the september ipo so really priced to perfection uh it could be down more frankly given the fact uh that they posted a wider loss and their product sales forecast uh, was a little bit disappointing. So again, they are learning what it means to be a publicly traded company uh, and the reporting process. Right now, that decline, given the fact that the stock is, again, up 142% since September, uh, seems relatively modest. Let's see what comes, though, as investors continue to go uh, through the details of the quarter. But a bright spot, we do, of course, have CrowdStrike, and this stock is trading higher, uh, the cybersecurity company. And so this really is showing a case of a need to have. You need the cybersecurity. This stock is already up a big way in a big way this year, up 185%. Now in the after hours, up nearly 12%. They beat, they boosted, something that uh, folks need. And you could even make the case uh, with the pandemic more so with everybody working from home. So we once again around the pandemic have this case of the haves and the have nots, the nice to haves and the need to haves. CrowdStrike doing quite well as a holding company of cybersecurity companies, a need to have and soaring right now. Meantime, Abigail, just minutes ago, the U.S. clearing, the U.S. House clearing the China delisting bill, sending it to the president. I know we're going to see some reaction likely when China markets open, but this is another big story that had U.S. stocks rallying today. Quickly, what does this mean? You know, not too much of a reaction right now, Emily. I don't think that this comes as too much of a surprise because this has been, you know, a piece of uh, news that investors have been expecting for quite some time. So I was just taking a look at Alibaba and Baidu, two of the companies uh, that could be, uh, you know, a piece of it. Not much happening there. And that was actually the case for stocks more broadly on the day, Emily. We did uh, eke out a record high for the S&P 500, but up just two-tenths of 1%. The Nasdaq 100 up just fractionally. Tesla taking a breather, down 2.7% after that huge rally on the fact that it will be included in the S&P 500 come December 21st. But of course, the spark for the rally that we have had out of November, that is the vaccine. And positive news today relative to Pfizer's vaccine uh, partnered with BNTech, the UK has has approved it. It will be distributed next week, 800,000 doses. Uh, that will be very interesting, Emily, because of course nobody knows how this is going to go. This RNA vaccination, which requires two booster shots, and apparently uh, it's not the easiest process. So it's going to be interesting to see how it goes there in the UK, but clearly a very piece, positive piece of news. Okay. And it's expected to come here in the US not so long from now too.
All right, Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much for that roundup. Speaking of the vaccine, as COVID cases hit another record number here in California and New York City reported its highest daily tally since May, the vaccine cavalry can't come soon enough. The UK's approval of Pfizer's vaccine for emergency use makes it the first Western country to roll out shots. New York Governor Cuomo said the state's residents can expect to receive 170,000 Pfizer doses on December 15th if cleared by regulators. Distribution plans from all U.S. states do Friday. Joining us to discuss the rollout and what's next are Bloomberg Health reporter Michelle Cortez. So, Michelle, how did the U.K. beat the U.S. on this approval? And are they taking a risk here in going first? Getting a vaccine for coronavirus has been a very huge priority for Boris Johnson, the prime minister of the UK. And in all honesty, they did not require the same set of standards that the U.S. Food and Drug Administration did, which was two months of follow-up in order to assure safety. The FDA regulators and regulators at the European Medicines Agency are literally combing through the details of these applications and basically going over the map to make sure that everything is accurate. In the UK, they were able to move much more quickly. I think that they didn't go through with that fine tooth comb that we're seeing with other regulators, and they didn't require that two month follow up. So they are able to move a little bit more quickly here. That being said, the US and Europe are not far behind. And by the time folks in the UK are able to get the vaccine, there will have been a decision from the FDA and, and Europe. So they'll know whether or not other agencies also found this to be a safe and effective therapeutic. So here's the question everyone is asking. When will I get my vaccine? When does this mean that, you know, obviously we all fall into different categories, our parents, our children. Um, you know, what is the timeline as far as you can tell right now? I'll run you through the timeline really quickly, and it is astonishing, I have to say. We're expecting about 20 million doses before the end of the year here. The first doses are going to go to medical professionals, healthcare workers, and the highest risk people who are living in nursing homes. They think it's going to take about three weeks to reach all of those people. Again, astonishing three weeks. So by about mid-January, we'll have all of those folks. Then we're going to move to a little bit lower risk people. That's elderly people, others with comorbidities. Maybe you're overweight. Maybe you have asthma, something like that. Then it comes to about April. That's when your average person, somebody who's relatively young and healthy, doesn't have any coexisting conditions, will be able to start getting vaccination. That's also about the time when kids will start being able to get vaccinated. We're going to need additional trials in kids to make sure it's safe for them because a lot of these vaccines haven't been studied in children yet, but those trials will not take a long time to enroll. So we're looking about April by then. And what that does for us is that says that by the end of this summer, we should have enough people vaccinated in the U.S., the majority of Americans, so that we'll reach herd immunity. That means in the fall, we're going to be to our new normal, whatever that might be. But it will likely include things like going back to the office, sending all of our children to school in person, college sports will be back on, and many of those things that we've all been missing for the past year should be coming back. Wow, Michelle, that is quite a future you just painted, if all goes to plan. I want to ask a little bit more about children. Dr. Fauci over the weekend said that it would be months, as you say, before kids actually get the vaccine. How many of the vaccines have actually been tested on young children? I know teenagers are a slightly different category, but you know I, I understand that most of these trials have been done on adults. So what does that mean about how well these shots will work in young kids? Right. Well, to your point, exactly. There have been exceedingly few of these uh, shots that have been tested in kids at this point. When you're looking at age 14 and up, you have some of that. But Pfizer, for example, didn't have any children in its trials. And the reason why they do that is because childhood is an important period of time, right? There's a lot happening in those developing bodies. And you need to make sure that you're not doing any harm to these kids. So what you want to do is you want to try these. And remember that people who get vaccinated are healthy, normal people, and you're trying to prevent a theoretical risk. You're not actually definitively giving them a benefit. They might not ever encounter coronavirus. And if they did, they might not get sick from it. So you have to make sure that there's a higher bar here. You don't want to give them anything that could increase the risk of harm because they might not 
get any benefit from it even after they receive it. So you do all your testing in, in healthy adults first, and then you bring it back to, to the kids. But you don't need to do as much testing once you get to the kids once you've determined that it's safe in older folks, you need to look at their immune responses to make sure that the way their immune systems respond are the same, that their antibody levels get to the same levels. And then you only need to watch them for about okay. you know, a month or 48 days to make sure that it's safe. So early spring we're looking at. Fascinating. Well, thank you so much for breaking it all down for us. You're answering the questions that we all want to know. The answers to Michelle Cortez, uh, our Bloomberg Health reporter. Thank you so much. Coming up, as President-elect Biden begins his transition process, we are going to take a look at what policymakers need to do to ensure the U.S. can maintain the continuity of government and safeguard national security. This is Bloomberg. As the U.S. continues to face potential security threats, including nation-state cyber attacks, a smooth and orderly transfer of power from the Trump administration is needed to keep the country secure. President-elect Biden has introduced his team of national security experts, saying it's a team that reflects the fact that America is back. Will this team be able to safeguard our nation? Joining us to discuss, Jamil Jaffer, founder and executive director of the National Security Institute. Uh, Jamil, obviously, you have a lot of thoughts here. So far, we've seen Anthony Blinken, uh, the nominee for state. We're expecting Michelle Flournoy to be the nominee for defense. How do you think the picks that have an impact on our national security are rounding out? Well, look, this is a serious group of people. These are people who have been around a long time. Uh, they've served on Capitol Hill. They've served at the Department of Defense before. They've served in the White House. Uh, these are people with great experience. Um, and frankly, a team that um, that looks a lot like the prior team in the Obama administration. So that's raised some questions about, will this just be Obama 2.0? I think the likely answer is no, because I think they're going to learn lessons from the mistakes of the Obama administration, the Syria red line, uh, the, the mistakes on the Iran nuclear deal. You know, and I think they're going to do better. And frankly, I think they're going to be a little more forward leaning coming off of four years of a fairly forward leaning administration. So... What are your outstanding concerns? There are still some positions that need to be filled. We're in a very unique spot, uh, given what's happened with CISA and uh, the controversy that is unfolding there. Um, you know, what are uh, th the big question marks for you? Yeah, you know, great question. I mean, I think, look, a few things. We still have a SECDEF nominee, so it's likely to be Fornoy, although there's been talk about General Lloyd Austin, talk about Jay Johnson, so we'll see what comes of that. Uh, we also don't have a nominee for CIA director. It will be really interesting to see uh, pre by, uh, President-elect Biden select a Republican for one of those jobs. I don't think that's likely, but it'd be really interesting if he does that. Um, and then, you know, there's obviously CISA and, and, and Chris Krebs' old job. They put Krebs back in that job. That would be an interesting move. Um, who do they pick at cyber coordinator at the White House? You know, will it be Bruce Reed, as some have said, or somebody else? So there's a lot of still open questions, particularly as it comes to technology and national security. We'll see how it plays out. But right now, I mean, Jake Sullivan is national security advisor. Excellent pick. Very sharp guy. Good friend. And a, and a rock star in national security. Speaking of Chris Krebs uh, receiving death threats, including from one of the president's lawyers, no matter your politics, I, I assume you think that's unacceptable. Yeah, no matter your politics, uh, Emily, nor what you think about election fraud or anything else, there's no reason to be, you know, sending death threats about anybody. And frankly, a former U.S. attorney should know better. It's not a smart move. It's a mistake. It should be condemned by all politicians across the aisle. I'm troubled it hasn't been. Now, as we make this transition and what could still be a very messy transition of power, given the president still insists there has been fraud, are you concerned about the security of our country? Are you concerned about what's happening in cyberspace? You know, look, I'm always concerned about what's happening in cyberspace because we're under constant attack. I, I believe we are in a state of low-level war uh, with some key nation states, including China, in the cyber arena and have been for a while. Uh, now, that being said, look, I think the transition of power is actually going to happen. I think it's, it's, it's becoming clearer and clearer that the president is going to leave office on, on, on January 20th. Um, and, you know, it's going to work out the way it's supposed to. Has there been enough time for transition? No, but, you know, this sometimes happens like it did with Bush v. Gore. Hopefully we don't have a, a you know, a problem like we did then. Um, but, you know, I think at the end of the day, we're pretty safe as a nation and we're pushing back on our enemies. 
What about the president threatening to veto a defense bill unless it includes a provision abolishing Section 230, a defense bill that is designed to protect our national security? Yeah, look, I mean, I think uh, we've seen Senator Inhofe, Republican. Uh, we've seen uh, Mitch McConnell, uh, Leader McConnell. We've seen Nancy Pelosi. We've made, it's, it's been clear across the aisle on both sides of the, of the House and the Senate um, that they're not going to do 230 in uh, the NDAA. And so I think the people people recognize the president is upset. Frankly, you know, the president is actually aligned with where Senator uh, President-elect Biden um, and uh, and Bruce Reed, his advisor, are, which is they all have concerns about 230. A lot of people on the Hill have concerns about 230. Whether those are, are well-placed or not, it's almost certainly not happening in NDAA. And so the president now is going to have to see if he's going to walk back from his veto threat. I think it's likely because there's also this issue of renaming the bases that the House and Senate are going to try and pass this by a veto-proof margin to say, look, don't veto it. You're going to get overridden. I don't think the president wants that on his last few weeks in office. All right, we shall see. Jamil Jaffer of Iron Net Cybersecurity, always great to have your thoughts here on the show. Jamil, thanks so much for stopping by. Okay, coming up, our conversation with Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff about his company's latest big acquisition of Slack and why this could be a competitive move against Microsoft. That is next. This is Bloomberg. It's one of the biggest tech deals of the year. Salesforce has agreed to buy Slack for $27.7 billion in cash and stock. That will give the corporate software giant a popular workplace communications platform. I caught up with Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff about the deal. It's a marriage made in heaven, and we could not be more excited about this combination and how it transforms our customer 360 vision and lets our customers work from anywhere uh, it's just the most exciting thing I've been through. Now, many people are looking at this as a defensive move against Microsoft. What's your response to that? <laughs> well, you can see Salesforce has really never been stronger. We just uh, delivered a phenomenal quarter, raised our guidance, $21.1 billion this year. We're going to do over $25.5 billion in revenue next year. Emily, it's the fastest growing enterprise software company ever of all time. Salesforce has never been stronger. And when we look at Slack, which is also a tremendously fast growing company, but has really a breakthrough technology, the idea that you can collaborate and have channels. And, you know, we've integrated our products already, um, but this idea that you can have this next generation work from anywhere environment runs on my phone, runs on my iPad. Amazing what is possible for me here. So you're no stranger to deals, some 60 deals in your tenure at Salesforce that said the stock slipped when reports of this deal first broke. And there are folks who think this is just too expensive for a company that has less than a billion dollars in revenue. What is your response to that? It's a very common narrative. I've done, like you said, 60 deals, you know, some of the largest deals ever done in the technology industry, including Exact Target, which is a company we grew from a few hundred million dollars to a couple billion. Uh, we've also have done an incredible transaction a couple years ago now with Tableau. Of course, it was the same narrative then, but now we can see a couple billion dollars in uh, revenue and tremendous market share gains since we acquired the company. And again, the deep integration with our customers and our customer 360. And here we are again with Slack. It's our same playbook. We're just going to execute it. We know uh, we have a lot of swagger. We have a good feeling that we know what to do. We're going to execute and deliver tremendous value to our global customers. Salesforce CEO Mark Benioff there just after the deal was announced. And sticking with that, I want to bring in Dan Ives of Wedbush Securities for a reaction. Dan, is this a deal, a, a marriage made in heaven? A lot of marriages don't work out, as we know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, I think what, what Benioff is alluding to is in terms of the cloud wars, they basically needed to do this deal. It was a now or never, and I believe to compete more and more with Microsoft. You can't argue with the strategy. You look at Tableau, you look at MuleSoft, and now Slack. I think that's sort of the golden combination. Stock knee jerk, you know, off on dilution and the price they pay. But I view it as a near term pain for long term gain. What about for Slack? Slack, despite its popularity, the shares have languished you know you look at zoom shares which have gone up 500 percent and slack shares you know were basically you know where they were at ipo until this deal was reported 
Yeah, for Slack, I think this was clearly the right move because they're going up against Microsoft and Redmond. And that was becoming more and more competitive going up against them. And I think you saw that in the growth rates. And, you know, for them to hit the bid now, I think that's a smart move. And, of course, for shareholders – and I think it just speaks to Microsoft becoming just more and more of a force in the cloud. And ultimately, Salesforce does not do this deal if it's not for that company in Redmond. So what are you going to be watching to see if Salesforce can indeed pull this off? Yeah, I think similar to Tableau, it's really trying to understand from customers is the cross-sell and the value prop there over – you know, once this deal closes. Because if you look at the guidance, I think it's the sandbag number in terms of what they gave for Slack. So if they're able to to ultimately, you know, execute on that, then this really becomes a beat and raise story, you know, for the next four to six quarters. But it all comes down to messaging. And if you look with Microsoft, that stack is tougher and tougher to compete with. And this is a shot across the bow at Microsoft, but they're not just going to sit there you know, uh, on a treadmill and they continue to accelerate. But I think it's a big enough ocean for more than one boat. And I think there's going to be a lot of successful players in cloud, Salesforce front and center. How competitive do you think this combination can be to Microsoft? I mean, remember, we believe Salesforce was also trying to buy LinkedIn when Microsoft scooped it up. Yeah, I think right now, Microsoft, I don't view it as tremendously competitive versus Microsoft when I, I view this combo. I think over time, when I look out a year from now, you know, I think that's where it starts to become more competitive, especially on the collaboration front. And for Salesforce, they're playing a different game. I mean, they need to have that end-to-end -end suite. And that's why you look at the strategy and what they're doing. They need to get out of that sales and marketing department to the broader end-to-end -end solution. And if, if it wasn't Slack, they were not going to be able to do this organically. We've seen it. That's been a you know, one-step-forward, two-steps-back approach. So I continue to believe this is the right move for Salesforce, even though it's you know from three months ago not doing M&A. And I think it's hard to argue with the success and the strategy that Benioff has shown. All right. Uh, well, we're going to be following, of course, uh, Benioff and Stuart Butterfield appearing together on stage at Dreamforce, which we will be covering throughout the week as well. Dan Eyes of Wedbush Securities, thank you so much for your uh, analysis, as always. Coming up, everyone's favorite stay-at-home stock, seeing some recovery from yesterday's plunge. Zoom CFO Kelly Steckelberg joins us for her outlook on the video platform next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. A company rocketed to popularity as businesses shut their doors and workers rent remote. Zoom Video, one of this year's top market performers, released earnings yesterday that seemed to indicate the video platform is doing just fine. However, the devil is in the details as revenue growth beat estimates, but at a slower rate than previous quarters, this leaving investors worried about the company's growth in a post-COVID world. With me now for a closer look at what the numbers mean and what to expect next year, Zoom CFO Kelly Steckelberg. Kelly, thanks so much for joining us. Always good to have you. So look, any other company with earnings like this, we would be celebrating. I mean, revenue jumping 367%. But with signs of slowing growth, some investors are concerned. The stock did uh, win back some of the gains that, that, that they lost yesterday. But what are you saying to investors to convince them about Zoom's continued growth in a post-COVID world? Hi, Emily. Thanks for having me. So, you know, first of all, we hope for an effective vaccine as quickly as possible to minimize this disruption. But, you know, remote work trends were happening pre-COVID. And what we've seen is through this period of time during the pandemic, an acceleration of adoption and also an embracing of Zoom. So we don't expect those trends to stop any time after COVID. In fact, we've been working very closely with our customers and talking to them about it. What is their work from anywhere strategy in a post-vaccine world? And we're super excited about some of the innovation that we announced in October at Zoomtopia. Things like 
you know, voice commands so that when they send their employees back to the office, they can do so in a way that feels safe to them. There's virtual reception to do that as well. And then my own personal favorite is smart gallery. So if you think about one of the good things that's come out of this period of time with all of us working remotely is the democratization of communication. All of our squares are the same size on this screen and it gives everyone a voice. And so what Smart Gallery does is it really enhances that face-to-face -face communication experience when we move to a space, which is most likely where you have some workers in the office and you have some working from home, but bringing them together in the same way that you have today, the same experience you have today when everybody's on kind of the same playing field. So working very closely, we also have some super exciting products like Zoom Phone. We see customers really thinking more strategically now around what is their work from anywhere work kit, toolkit that they're giving their employees, and Zoom Phone is a really integral part of that. So we're excited about the future now, and working closely with our customers around that. Now, part of the reason Zoom is so popular is it is free. Will Zoom continue to offer to consumers for free or down the line, could we see you start charging fairly. So um, we have an aspect of our product that's free that you're work talking about, and we love our free hosts. They're a very important part of the Zoom ecosystem. We also have given Zoom for free to over 125,000 educational institutions around the globe today that are using for free. And we feel very strongly that it's our corporate responsibility to do so. We also turned off the 40 minute limit here in the US for Thanksgiving. And we're really committed to doing what we can to support the global community during this period of disruption. And you know, the, the free users of our platform are really an important part of our ecosystem. And I think if we didn't have the free users, if you think about the, they really contributed to the viral growth, and we didn't have it there, um, we would probably be paying more in sales and marketing. So we feel like it's a really great trade-off and that every time a free user starts a Zoom meeting, they have the opportunity to expose somebody else to the power of Zoom. Meantime, the day of your earnings, Slack and Salesforce announced a big tie up. Slack has been sort of the other work from home darling, but their shares, uh, you know, their stock chart doesn't look anything like Zoom's to be fair. What is your take on the Slack Salesforce deal? So both Slack and Salesforce are great partner and customers of ours. And so we're very excited. Congratulations to both of them on this deal. And you know, if you, if you think about it, we are all companies that are focusing on different aspects of enterprise technology. And we are all clearly committed to this best of breed strategy. And so I think it's great that those two organizations are coming together. We work very closely with them already. So I think that we will continue to do. In fact, it'll probably be more simplified manner now that there's two parties coming together closely to integrate for our customers benefit rather than three. Some have suggested this will lead to more consolidation in the software industry. Do you agree? You know, what we're really focused on at Zoom is delivering happiness to our customers. And we, for ourselves right now, that's really committing to innovation across the platform with all of our product lines, also the new platform on Zoom that we announced in October. So we have lots to focus on from an independent company perspective, and that's what we think is best for us today. Um, you know, in terms of other consolidations across the organization or the company and the um, industry, I think we'll have to wait and see. So does that mean you're very focused on innovating from within? Because Zoom has really sort of kept its M&A powder dry. Could we see you make acquisitions? Are you out there looking or is that just not on the table right now? So a couple of things, you know, we have a lot of opportunity ahead for us to grow with Zoom phone, as I mentioned on Zoom International. And so we wanna make sure that we're staying really focused on the opportunities ahead. With that said, we did our first acquisition in Q2 with the Keybase team. We're thrilled to have them as part of our organization. They've really helped accelerate our development in terms of security. And that's how we think about it. We always are looking for opportunities to augment either our talent or our technology through acquisition. We have a corp dev team. This is what they think about every day. We just haven't found the next right match, but it doesn't mean we're not always thinking about it. Now, clearly, we're all going to use Zoom more in uh, you know, a more normal world, a new normal world than we did before the pandemic happened. But use is going to change. How do you imagine we will use Zoom, companies will use Zoom, consumers, schools will use Zoom on a daily basis when everything is truly back to normal and there is no health risk? Yeah, I think that what we've seen is that Zoom has become integrated into all aspects of our life. 
And the goal of, of Eric, our founder and CEO, is to make a Zoom meeting better than an in-person meeting. And you've already seen progress we've made in that area around the upmarket with things like voice to text transcription, meeting notes that we can done. And I think you're going to continue to see that with things like Zoom apps, which are the also the, the new apps that are in prototype that we announced at Zoomtopia, which are allow developers to start developing apps that have in-meeting experiences. So you can collaborate better, you can do things like project management within the meeting itself. And so that's how we're going to continue to augment this meeting experience to make it more and more productive. It's also how consumers are going to do it through on Zoom. So on Zoom is the platform we announced also at Zoomtopia that is the event hosting platform that's going to start to bring together hosts and attendees in a, a seamless way. It's also going to be a directory of events that serves as a discovery mechanism. So you, if you wake up in the morning, you're like, hey, I want to go to a live yoga class today. You can go to on Zoom, see what's available, sign up quickly through one click and be in a Zoom uh, yoga class. So these are how I think Zoom is going to be incorporated in our lives, even when we have the opportunity to move around the world safely again. All right, Zoom CFO Kelly Steckelberg uh, joining us in uh, from your home in this remote uh, pandemic universe. Thank you so much, Kelly. Always good to have you here on the show and interesting to see, hear your thoughts on how the future will be different. Coming up. BlackBerry saw shares rise the most ever yesterday on a stellar deal made with Amazon. We're going to be speaking with BlackBerry CEO John Chen next. This is Bloomberg. Big news for BlackBerry, the company announcing it is working with Amazon Web Services to develop a new intelligent vehicle data platform named Ivy. According to BlackBerry and AWS, Ivy will allow automakers to remotely check sensors and improve the performance of cars linked to the cloud. This brought shares to all-time highs during yesterday's trade. The stock has paired its gains since then. With me now, BlackBerry CEO John Chen. John, it has been a while since we talked, and obviously you've been hard at work in that time. What does this mean for BlackBerry? What does this mean for cars? Well, uh, yeah, thank you. I have been, haven't, haven't chatted a long time. And yes, we've been very hard at work. And by the way, this project we've been working with um, Amazon had taken us probably about two years. Um, we started this whole program about two years ago at CES. We demonstrate a little piece of technology at that time, and obviously not as elaborate as today, but at that time we already had the vision of really building a data analytics platform uh, from A to Z, you know, end to end, uh, for application provider, for car manufacturers, for consumer to be able to tap into in a secure and seamless manner. So that's what that, well, that's what it does for the market and that's what that's for customers and obviously BlackBerry create a data business that we don't have and I long wanted a recurring data business so this just may promise to be a good one uh, down the road. Now you talked up QNX to me years ago and I'm curious how critical a role uh, you believe BlackBerry will Pay, play in cars as a result of the work that you have done. Um, could you repeat the last part? How I'm having trouble hearing. Well, go ahead. You you talked up you talked up QNX years ago. You know when this was just a nascent technology and believed back then that BlackBerry would play a huge role in cars. What is the technology that you have that Amazon wants and needs? Um, well, QNX is a secure safety certified operating system, which has achieved the highest level of safety certifications. Um, I think that's very important to Amazon. The other part is we're very hard at work in the IoT space, which Amazon said make a lot of investment themselves. And so, and the alignment of the fact that we like Andy said, Jesse said yesterday at their reInvent conference, we could redefine how the industry works together. And, and so at data analytics, uh, machine learning, um, 
you know, it sounds like I'm throwing all the buzzword out, but it's true. Uh, and, 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 and the kind of the IoT enabling um, with our safety certified environment and the platform we could build to um, emulate everything is happening, including the census, uh, those are the technology that is interesting to Amazon. Might you have other partnerships on the horizon with other big car makers, a company like Tesla, perhaps? We, uh, we, we are speaking to a number of them. Some of them sounds more advanced and more promising. It's a little too early for us to talk about wins. Uh, and and when, when it happens, uh, I'll, I'll, sure to make, I'll, make, I'll sure to let you know how's that. Thank you, thank you. Well, look, Apple and Google all have car tech integrations and platforms, but it's taken time to see these things get to market. How do you compare what they offer, where they are, to where BlackBerry is and what BlackBerry has to offer? I know they're all to, different technologies. Yeah, it, it's a very broad subject, but I, I think of two things that are more unique. Uh, first of all, we've been in the business a lot longer in the auto business a lot longer than Apple and Google has been uh, in the auto business. So we have an ongoing stream of customers and, and revenue. Uh, and so, and we're expanding that in a, just now I said, I, I, I spoke about the data, data driven uh, revenue. Um, so so that's, that's number one. Number two is we do a lot of the pumping, you know, a, a lot of the secure back channel um, communications, Kind of a trusted broadcasting um, messaging. We do a lot of those uh, safety hypervisors, clusters. You know those those things that makes the whole dashboard looks pretty. Uh, you know they do a lot more user interface. Uh, our orientation a lot more about the ecosystem. Their orientation about the user, um, which Amazon is very strong in, and this is one of the big reasons why we want to partner with Amazon because they bring the consumer and the user experience and interfaces to us. So, um, so, so that's the difference between us and Apple versus um, um, uh, Google. The other last point that I think is a very important point is our technology, this collaboration we talk about, uh, we just announced, um, allows a car manufacturer to own their own customer. In some of the names that you just mentioned, will not allow that to happen. They will own the data and therefore they will own the customers. I don't own the data, I don't interpret the data, I just transport it. All right, John Chen, BlackBerry CEO. Good to have you back with a bang. Thank you so much for stopping by. We'll of course continue to follow how the partnership plays out and what partnerships come next. Well, nothing is off the table in Bob Iger's future. The Disney executive chair and former CEO is weighing the next chapter when he finally leaves the company in December of next year. Iger told Carlisle's David Rubenstein that he's considering public service, including a potential role in the Biden administration. You weren't as successful in leaving the company because uh, you had wanted to leave a few years earlier and then the, they, the board said, no, you got to stay longer because you did the uh, the Fox acquisition, among other things. So uh, why were you so good at running the company, but not so good at leaving the company? I, you know, I'm told that that's a, a common ailment of CEOs uh, that have had decent tenure. Uh, and I, so I failed leaving a few times. Uh, the first time uh, we had had a succession process that didn't work out as we had hoped. And so I agreed to stay on a little bit longer. And then the last time was solely due to the largest acquisition that we had ever made and that was most of the assets of 21st Century Fox. And I knew when I proposed doing that to the board, uh, which was you know, close to when I was supposed to step down, that they would say, well, we will uh, support you in this effort as long as you agreed to stay. They did not want, and for good reason, to go through a CEO transition just at the time we were making the biggest acquisition we'd ever made. Well, it was rumored in the press and in your book that you were thinking of leaving Disney to run for president of the United States. So whoever heard of a businessman running for president of the United States? So where did you get that idea from? Crazy, crazy idea, right? Um, 
Well, there was some truth to that, um, both before the 16 election and then after the 16 election, uh, I gave it some serious thought. Actually, post the election of Donald Trump, I gave it a lot of thought and actually did a fair amount of homework to study the feasibility of it. But I'm not sure I would have gotten as far as actually running, uh, because as the realist in me was, was sinking in, I was starting to think more and more about how difficult the path might be in the Democratic Party for a businessman to actually get the nomination. Uh, what would you say is the chance that you would be interested in serving in a senior position in a Biden administration? Would that be something of any interest to you, or you wouldn't want to come to Washington for that kind of thing? Well, I've always thought about what the next chapter in my life might be uh, post-Disney, because there will be a post-Disney soon. Uh, I'm not going to fail stepping down again. Uh, and giving back in some fashion, uh, serving our country in some fashion is certainly something that I would consider seriously, but a lot of it would depend on you know, what it is, what the opportunity is, and whether I thought it would be something that I would both be stimulated by and, and, and be good at. All right, we'll be watching to see what Bob Iger does next. Disney Executive Chair Bob Iger with David Rubenstein. Still ahead after fast approval by US, UK, excuse me, UK regulators, Britons will get first dibs on a COVID vaccine developed by Pfizer and BioNTech. Sean Merritt, BioNTech Chief Commercial Officer, provides a production and distribution timeline with us next. This is Bloomberg. The UK has become the first Western country to approve a COVID vaccine. British regulators cleared Pfizer and BioNTech shot ahead of decisions in the US and European Union. BioNTech Chief Commercial Officer Sean Merritt spoke earlier with Bloomberg Sky Johnson and Alex Steele and gave us an idea of when to expect the first doses. Take a listen. What we've um, publicly disclosed is that for, for all countries, uh, we're producing and we'll have ready up to 50 million doses this year and um, and uh, we will be sticking to that target and should be able to uh, provide up to 50 million this year going into next year um, including the 50 million from this year we anticipate uh, 1.3 billion in total i don't think we've disclosed what we're going to be providing in the first half but what i can say is of course uh, we're ramping up production extremely quickly uh, so that we can get the vaccine to everyone as quickly as possible. Sean, just picking up on that point, do you see yourself bringing in more capacity? Are you negotiating for more capacity with others? Um, can you give us an idea of, of kind of how those conversations going, if they are taking place? I mean, I think what you might have noticed is from the BioNTech uh, network, we've added a factory which we bought from Novartis uh, completing in October, and we're bringing that up to speed. That once it gets into steady state, we expect that to produce 750 million doses per year. Pfizer at the same time are uh, bringing up uh, their manufacturing as quickly as possible, both in the United States and, of course, here in Europe, where we'll be serving the UK very, very, very shortly. Uh, uh, and uh, we anticipate uh, adding capacity, further capacity next year as needed. Um, we're also supplying, of course, a Fosun in China, uh, which is our other partner for China. Uh, and they also have plans for, the, for manufacturing too. Uh, what seemed left out there are other European countries like Germany, for example. Are you negotiating with any other European countries right now about distribution? Uh, no, no we've, we've, we've done all negotiations through the European Commission representing uh, all of the states in uh, Europe. Uh, the only one where we have been uh, separately, where we separately negotiated uh, was the United Kingdom. Talking of the United Kingdom, can you walk me through what your expectations are for the UK to be able to deliver a seamless distribution. Where do you worry? Where do you see the challenges? You guys have put a lot of work in to get this ready quickly. The UK has now cleared it. Can you just kind of just, can you just give us your visibility on the challenge of getting it into people's arms? Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a, there's a uh, National Health Service distribution plan, and um, uh, I think that's really for the 
for the government to comment on. I mean, from our perspective, what what, what we're doing together with uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, our um, uh, marketing and distribution partner Pfizer is making sure we do get the vaccine uh, to everyone quickly. And in terms of um, in terms of distribution, I mean, when you receive this vaccine, uh, it really is you roll up your sleeve, uh, you get an injection in your arm of this vaccine. Uh, and then uh, you wait a wait a few minutes. This is customary to uh, to make sure that there are no uh, side effects that uh, wouldn't be expected. And then you go home, and it's it's pretty much like getting the flu vaccine. That was Sean Merritt, BioNTech's chief commercial officer. And that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Bloomberg Asia is coming up next. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>